Hey everyone, welcome back to Bam Bam Print. I'm Nick, and in today's video, we're going to be tackling the challenge of printing large 3D models with ease. Unfortunately, accomplishing this in Bamboo Studio just isn't feasible at the size and complexity of our model. For this tutorial, I'll be resizing and cutting a Triceratops skull that will be around 4 to 5 feet in width and about 6 feet from nose to back. I'll be using the software called Lubin. Lubin makes cutting and resizing large models super simple, perfect for fitting them into any size printer build volume. Once we have the model cut into multiple pieces, we will then jump into Bamboo Studio and set up our workflow. Go over some print settings and send our first piece to the printer. As usual, I'll try to be as thorough as possible and explain everything without dragging it out. So without further delay, let's just jump right in. You can download the Lubin software and get a free 30-day trial at lubin3d.com. Once you have the software downloaded and installed, it will look like this. It likes to give you tips along the way, so just hit yes and keep them displaying for later. Currently I'm running the version build August 1st, 2024. It doesn't seem to use a version number, so I'll go with this build date. Now at first glance, you might be a little overwhelmed, but don't worry, I'll walk you through each step of the way. Once you finish this video, you should be printing large 3D models in no time. The first thing we need to do is import our Triceratops model. Oh, and by the way, this model is completely free. I downloaded it from Colts 3D, and we'll add a link in the description below if you wanted to follow along. First go up to File, then Open. Then browse for the model you would like to enlarge and cut. After your model is open in the view pane, it will display in a colorful rainbow. The colors go from dark blue at the bottom of the z-axis to red at the top of the z-axis. Now let's quickly go over the interface and the software before moving forward. If you left click the mouse and drag, it will orbit around the model, just like in Bamboo Studio. The mouse wheel will zoom in and out. Now if you right click, it will rock the model back and forth. And the way you pan around the view pane is by pressing down on the middle mouse wheel and moving around. Now along the outside edge of the model, you can see an XYZ axis with numbers. Those numbers represent the size of the model for that particular axis in millimeters. Alright, now that we have the basics of the interface behind us, let's go ahead and resize our model. The nice part about the cut tool is you can actually scale the model as well. So next, let's go up to Mesh, then down to Cut. The tooltip will pop up again. It will give you another tip, basically telling you that you need to hit the Enter button after changing a value in a field to update it. Hit the Yes button and leave tips on. The next window will ask you to select your unit type. You can change this to inches if you like, but I like to keep everything uniform, so I'll just stick with millimeters. Hit OK and the cut menu will open up on the left hand side. It is broken up into three different sections, input, cutting plane, and connector. First we need to change our cut method from planar cut to modular cut. Next let's set up our printer build plate size. I have a bamboo so I'll leave the bed shape to rectangular and change the X, Y, and Z to 256. Leave Close Cut to Yes and Natural Cut to No, as that uses an algorithm to generate the cut and doesn't usually give us what we want. If you want to imprint a part number to your model, you can select Yes to that option. Adding a part number is definitely helpful when you have a ton of different models to print. Before we move further, let me explain what you're seeing here in the view pane. We have two turquoise transparent cubes around our model, stacked on top of each other. These are basically two 256 cube printing areas of our bamboo. So as our model sits right now, it will basically take two separate prints to complete. One would print most of the model, which is the cube on the bottom, and the second, you can see the nose barely sticking into the second cube on top, which is our second print. For this project, I was thinking a four foot wide Triceratops would be perfect. So to do that, we need to resize our x-axis. I know that four feet is 1219 millimeters. You can literally translate the sizing in Chrome's URL bar by typing in four feet into millimeters, and it will spit it out to you. So now that we know the width I want in millimeters, let's resize our model. Under the input section, go into the size X field and type in 1219 and push enter. You will now see a bunch of transparent turquoise cubes around our model. All right, now here comes the fun part, cutting the model. We have three options for connectors, plug, dowel, and none. None will give you no kind of connection between the cut surface and will end up just being a flat cut. A plug will create both a male and female type of connector. For example, if we're cutting a model into two pieces, one part will have a piece that extrudes out and the other will have a hole where they fit together. With the dowel option, the cut will create a hole on both parts and a separate dowel will need to be printed and used to connect both parts together. My personal favorite is the plug option. I have tried dowels in the past and they just don't work all that great. However, both options have their advantages and disadvantages. I've come across models that have used the plug type of connection before and they're either too loose or too tight. Lubin actually gives you a way to adjust this, which is great. So with the plug option selected, let's move down to the design feature. When cutting large 3D models in Lubin, you have the option to add plugs, which help align and connect the pieces together once printed. There are three types of plugs, prism, frustum, and claw. 
For Prism, this plug has a simple, straight-sided shape, like a rectangle or square in the cross-section. It's easy to print and provides a basic alignment between parts. The Freston plug is a tapered shape, wider at the base and narrow at the top. This design helps align pieces more securely, making it easier to fit together during assembly. The claw plug has a more complex shape with interlocking teeth. This provides the strongest connection between parts, ensuring they stay aligned and fit together tightly. Each plug type offers different levels of stability and ease of assembly, allowing you to choose the best option based on your model's needs. For our example, I'm going to stick with Prism. Next, we need to decide on a shape. When using the Prism plug in Lubin's model cutting tool, you can choose from various shape options that determine the cross section of the plug. Here are the different types of Prism plug options. Square, triangle, pentagon, hexagon, octagon, circle, D-shape, and native. Each shape offers different levels of stability, ease of assembly, and printability, allowing you to tailor the connection based on your specific needs. For this project, I'm going to stick with the square option. Next up is the number option. This will generate the number of connectors for each cut section if there's enough space available to do so. I've come across pre-cut models and have seen one, two, or even three plus. I think two should be plenty enough, but I encourage you to experiment with this. The depth ratio is going to be the depth to width. The larger the number, the deeper the hole. The default 1.5 is a great option to start with, so I'll just leave it at that. Next up is the tolerance option, which is a really great feature. This is where we can adjust the fitting of our connector. The way it works is zero will get a snug fit. This can also prove to be an issue when you're 3D printing as you get variations in size from your printer. If we bump this down to a negative one, that will give us a little wiggle room. I honestly would not go any lower than negative one because if your connector is a little tight, you can always hit it with a hand file and take a little bit of the material off. Then you'll be good to go. All right, we are now ready to cut our model. Once you hit the cut button, it will open up a dialog box. Lubin is trying to put your cut pieces into a folder. I usually just use a folder where the current model is in and just add a new folder called cut. Now it won't put the pieces directly into that cut folder. It will add a new folder with a model name and a timestamp. All right, hit the select folder button. Now, since this is a pretty large model, it's going to process. It's going to take a little while, depending upon your computer speed. Once the process is complete, you will see an overview of what Lubin did. It will show you how many parts your model will be, the weight in kilograms, approximate print time, approximate time to assemble, and a running total. Now, of course, these numbers are going to be off if you have a pretty quick printer like a bamboo. That print time is going to be significantly lower. So for our Triceratops project, just the top skull is going to be 112 parts. Now, that may seem like a crazy amount of prints to you, but trust me, you'll get more and more used to it. Now, let me show you a cool feature. If you hit the E on the keyboard, Lubin will begin to explode the model apart and you can see all the connectors and pieces. And the opposite effect of that is to use the R on the keyboard and we'll put it back together. All right, we've now finished using Lubin. Let's go ahead and jump over to Bamboo Studio and get our workflow put together. So to keep this video from being too repetitive, I propose we finish by going over the following in Bamboo Studio. First, we'll import the first five Triceratops models. Then we'll set up the models on their own build plates and set up their orientation. Next, we'll go over some of the print settings that I'll use. And we'll finish it up by sending our first model to the printer. All right, let's go ahead and get started and import our first five models. So go ahead and click on the Add button up here in the top. We're going to select our first part, hold Shift down the keyboard, select number five, click Open. It's going to ask you how you want to load your models in. Go ahead and select No. And then we're going to add some additional build plates. Next, let's go ahead and separate all these into their own build plate. By the way, when I select my models, it's going to show you the name of them over here on the right corner. All right, now that we got the five models on their own build plate, let's go ahead and position them. So first I want to decide which surface I'm going to put this model on. Go ahead and select lay on face. I'm going to put it flat onto this peg right here. So if you click that, the model is going to flip over. And now you've got a little bit of a bump here because this peg isn't as tall as this one. But I think that's a good start for now. Now for this model, I'm going to pick this side here. Lay on face. Select that face. And that's looking good. We can go ahead and rotate it around. Perfect. Number three. Looks like this side isn't going to have a peg on it. So let's go ahead and pick that side. Lay on face. I'm going to pick that side. Number four, 
Um, we have two different options. This side or this side. I like to use the sides with the holes on them. So I'm going to just check this side first. I like this nice angle like this for the textured area. When your print leans on an angle like this, it helps alleviate the print lines from showing up. So I'm just going to go with that. And the last one is going to be on this surface here. Oh, that's. I mean, we could leave it flat on this side. It looks like it's already laying on that. Let me just double check. Yeah. So we can lean, we can leave it leaning like that. It's just going to obviously need some supports. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I have supports turned on. I'm going to use tree. Uh, let's go ahead and slice that model real quick. Yeah, a little bit of supports up in there, which is not too bad. The great thing about printing, you know, organic shapes like this is a lot of the times the scarring from your supports don't really show up. They're hard to see once you give them a little bit of a, a sanding. All right, so those are the first five parts and how I would position the models. All right, let's quickly go over the print settings. So for the quality tab, I think I have everything set to default. There's nothing special in here. For the strength tab, I changed my wall loops to five. Um, and I quickly wanted to go over that too. For this project, I plan to use it outside. So I'm going to print this in PETG and a little bit stronger than I normally would, uh, just for the fact that it's going to be outside. I live in Arizona, which is quite hot in the summer times. That extra strength is definitely going to help. I will most likely put it underneath a shaded area. I just wanted to make sure I have some extra strength. So I bumped this up to five and my infill is going to be set to 17. I do like to use triangles over gyroid. When you're printing such a large model like this, the triangles are going to print uh, a lot faster than gyroid. And we can actually look at that real quick and see what happens with our triangles infill set. So our time is going to be 12 hours and 49 minutes for the first part. So if we switch that to the gyroid, so 12 hours, 49 minutes compared to 16 hours, 42 minutes. So just one part alone is going to have a difference of about four hours. So if you count that over, <laughs> Over 116 parts, you're talking over, you know, 140 hours longer to print it in gyroid. Um, I rarely have any issues with triangle print. I know people are gun ho about gyroid just for the fact that it's you have less failures. But I think maybe I have an issue with, with triangles one out of 50 prints, 30 prints. That's why I use triangles. The strength of it and the uh, the speed you can't beat it so yeah 12 hours 44 minutes so yeah it's about four hours speed is all left the same you can take a look at those um, I don't think I made any adjustments and then support I have tree selected for this one I probably would do probably just normal and grid So this is going to be a lot better for this flat surface underneath here at the bottom for tree supports. They work, they work pretty good, but for a print like this, you're going to get a lot of stringing back and forth um, because they don't just, they don't give you as much support. So let's go ahead and switch that back to, to normal and grit. You can use grit or snug. Oh yeah, we are outside the boundary a little bit. We're not getting any supports for here either. So let's try that again. There we go. All right, let's quickly go over some of the support settings that I have adjusted. Just note that these are not a complete support tutorial as I'm planning to release that soon. But these minor changes have made a bit of difference in support removal for me. 
Remember, not all filament will print exactly the same, so take these as a guide and make sure you run a few tests on your own filament. I have experienced a difference from filaments like Sunlu, Polymaker, and even King Rune. King Rune White has a more matte-like finish, while Sunlu White has a more glossy finish. So these two in particular I have noticed give me different results when using the same settings. But I have seen good results from these adjustments. First is going to be the top Z distance. This will adjust the distance from the top of your filament interface and the object. I gave it a minor bump of a tenth of a millimeter. The base pattern spacing will actually space out the support lines to whichever amount you like. I adjusted mine to three millimeters. Increasing this too much could potentially cause issues for the support interface. Now, if you're not aware, supports have both a base and an interface. The support interface will appear as a darker green color. You can adjust the amount of top and bottom layer amounts as well as a pattern. If you have an AMS, you can actually select the filament type such as PLA to be your interface only. That can be changed here under the Support Raft Interface dropdown. This will reduce the amount of filament changes needed when compared to using the entire support material as a different filament. It will only need to do a swap for the two interface layers. Now the last setting I adjusted is the Support Object XY Distance. This has proven to be really handy when printing my dinosaur skulls and using tree supports. The tree supports like to print alongside the model and sometimes they tend to get stuck. So adjusting the distance has helped prevent that from happening. I have this setting set at 0.45 millimeters. I will end up using both support types depending on the model and my needs. I will definitely be going over these in the follow-up video once I have more of the Triceratops model added to my workflow. All right, so it looks like we are getting a little bit of an issue, so let's go ahead and fix that. Back over to prepare. We're going to go ahead and rotate just a little bit, and that should fix that. Go ahead and re-slice it. All right, this model looks like it's good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and send this to the printer. I will be making a follow-up video after the project is completely done. I did not wanna include it into this video because it's gonna take me a while to get this project completed. So I will be making a separate video, most likely on my entire workflow, on the print and the assembly, and then the final product. Oh, real quick, before we finish the video, I wanted to go over my naming convention here. So basically this is my dinosaur skull, my five wall and 17% infill user preset setting. So basically the way I name my presets is we have our layer height, our name of the project or type of projects that we're, I'm going to use this preset with. And then a couple of different ideas for like settings. Like I have five walls and 17% infill. Um, you can go as far as adding other, other details in, into the name. That way you can see it quickly, but that's usually what I do. And then you just click um, as a user preset and then you would click OK. I can go ahead and click save. It's going to change my orange settings and it will update that user preset. All right, that'll conclude the end of this video. I really enjoyed teaching you guys about Lubin and my work, a little bit of my workflow. I will be creating a separate video for this entire project once it's completed. I didn't want to include it in this because it's going to take me quite a bit of time to get it completed. Most likely that video will include the workflow, the print, and the assembly. So stay tuned for that. I hope you guys were able to learn something from this video. Have a great day and happy printing.